There is so much to look forward to, not only in terms of the drivers, but we've got some new cars on the grid. We've got different teams running different machinery. Uh, Adrian Flux with Power Max Racing, the return of Jason Plato, the return of Dan Lloyd as well. An awful lot to look forward to. The 2021 Quick Fit British Touring Car Championship was one of the fiercest on record. Full grids at every round made sure that the action was intense. At each event, there were three championship point scoring races, with the more successful drivers needing to carry ballast to ensure close racing and variable results. With front and rear wheel drive cars from manufacturer and independent teams, there was action all the way. There was an option tyre at four events, and that softer tyre would affect the pace of the cars and the race results as well. The scene was set for a season full of drama, as dreams were realised or dashed. Races won and lost in the toughest touring car championship of all. Jason Plato is an icon in the British Touring Car Championship with more wins than anyone else, 97 in all. He has a huge fan base and is a true character. Right, go and throw some bricks at some BMWs or something, eh? <laughs> yeah, any Hondas. Take your pick. But not everyone knows about how he started in the BCCC. We sat down with him at the place where it all began. Well, funny enough, it all started. My dad was a motor dealer and he was running BMW North Shields. He was the dealer principal, what I would call the dealer principal now. And someone owed him a few hundred quid and he took in a racing cart as a bit of a bad debt. And he bought this cart really for him and his sales map manager to go tearing around the forecourt on a Sunday when the garage was shut. And I would have been about 10 years old. Uh, yeah, 10. There was a time car auctions, wasn't a million miles from where we lived up in New Newcastle, and they obviously got a massive, great big car park. We used to go and tear us around there, of, you know, after school of an evening, until the police came and we'd get kicked off, and then we'd come back two hours later, later, later and start again and get kicked off. And then we found a club, you know, a circuit, a, a, a place called F Felton, which is near, near Morpeth in Northumberland. And that was it, and I loved it. I loved it. And it was it was our family thing, and you know within a, well that that year I won the club chat championship. Then we won some rounds in the, the British series, and then the following year, I started in 1980, 1981. I won the British chat championships, and and then you're on the you know off karting. So karting went until '87, and we you know we raced around around the world really. R raced a lot in Europe. Um, raced against Schumacher. Race against a lot of them. Race against Frentzen, Coulthard, McNish. But the transition to go from karting into, you know, formula cars wasn't like it is today, where there was a huge, I mean, there was a void, you know, it was like an ocean between the two. There was no, there was no crossover. And then went, went, went to the, the Winfield Elf Racing School in France and did the Pilot Elf um, school. and. Uh, up until that point, they'd had 26 Formula One drivers had gone through that school. So all the very best French greats, you know, Prost, Alessi, Arnoux, Jabouy, Damon, they all went through that school. And um, it's, a, it's a big regret actually, because I should have won the, the whole competition. But I, during this process of going over there for, oh, I, was, I was over there for maybe a, a month, and in between that period, Renault UK had launched the Formula Renault series in the UK. And we got speaking to them and we went to the launch, funny enough, at Whit Williams, but it was at their old factory in Didcot. And we kind of did a deal with Renault UK. And basically if I'd won the Pilot Elf competition, I'd have to go and live in France and race in France. I kind of didn't want to do that. So whilst I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't not win, I just didn't give it everything. And had I done, I think I could have won. And actually that might have got me to F1. 
Anyway, I started off doing Formula Renault in the UK with, 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 with Renault and then drove for Manor Motorsport in 1990 and then got the works um, Van Diemen Duckham's Drive in 1991, won the European Championship and then did F3. And then that's where all the wheels cut came off. Everyone realised we were telling fibs about how much money we had. <laughs> and it got to halfway through the year and obviously the cheques stopped coming from us because we didn't have the money and we lost the drive. So yeah, that's, that's what happened to the single city, city career. And then, you know, I literally, I stopped racing for two years, looked around, tried trying to find some sponsors, discovered what touring cars was all about. And then my good friends at Renault came back to me and said, for, and this was at the end of 1995, we were doing European Formula Renault series. And they said, look, we're launching a one make series called the Renault Sp Spider Cup. Would you consider it? And I said, no, mate, said, that's, the de that's the, the, the death of me. You know, one mate series, from where I've been, I would have been expected to win. There's no guarantees you would. And they said, well, before you make it your mind, just to let you know that the winner of the series gets a test with Williams. I signed up there and then. <laughs> and um, I think we won nearly every race. I think we won, I think it was about 12 races. I think we won 11 of the 12. Blitzed the championship, met Frank as we've seen and then um, about a week after got a letter saying look Jason you know you did a great test there is no drive but please don't feel like you've let yourself down because there never was one because we we need we need a you know a driver with profile and we've got uh, our Formula One test driver Jean-Christophe Bouillon and Gianni Morbidet Deleuze XF1 not that I thought there was a drive for me, but at least I thought I might be in with a chance because Renault were trying to help it along. There was nowhere else for me to go, that was it. I couldn't go sideways, you know, I was staring down the barrel of it, that's it, it's all over. And then two weeks after I got that letter, I just woke up full of hell. I thought, I'm not, I'm not having it. And that's when I stormed down here to see Frank. The tale of Jason landing a drive with Williams and Renault is a funny one, and luckily he was more than happy to yeah. reenact the story for us. Um, so anyway, I you know, arrived at security, because I'd met the two guys in there, three guys, whatever there was, a few weeks before. Hello, Jason, how are you? Great, I'm in. I've, I'm here to see Frank, gate comes up and I'm in, and I parked over there and then obviously walked to reception. But when I got there, then got chased out by Nicola, my plan was, I didn't really have one, but my plan was I needed to put my car from over there to somewhere here. I think it might have been over there actually I parked. So I could see recept I could see the, secu the security booth so that when Frank ar arrived in circa three hours, I could be, you know, I I'd know he was here. So basically I parked over there. That hedge wasn't there so I could see security and then at about mid midday, Frank's car arrived. At which point I stuffed a load of mints in, get rid of the cigarette smoke, and um, and then the car kind of shot along there. And I was worried that for some reason he had a secret entrance around the back. I don't know why I thought that. So I just started pelting after him with my briefcase. It was these these flower beds now are all being redone? But back in the day. They were, they, these were flat flower beds. I just charged across them. <laughs> so if you come out, I'll show, I'll show you where I went. I was in the middle of this grass here, flat out, and Frank, Frank's nurse Hamish turned right and parked where those, bi bi where, where those bins are, and that's Frank's parking space. But by now, <laughs> I'm doing what, 10 mile an hour? <laughs> in a full sprint. And Frank's car's pulled in here, I'm now trying to go from a full-blown sprint to a walk as quietly and as, <laughs> as I possibly can. And I can see Frank looking at me through the windscreen. And I've just got this, I can see him thinking, what is he doing? <laughs> anyway, and then get alongside the car and I forget, it's quite a performance to get Frank out in his wheelchair. Forgot about that. And I'm just looking through the passenger window 
Hamish got out of the car and I looked across the, the roof of the car and I could see Hamish's face. And he had this slight, was it, a, it like a smirk, like a smile and he was friendly. He had a friendly look at his face. I thought, ah, it's not so bad. They know I'm here. <laughs> anyway, they got Frank out of the car and he, he said, and Frank said, what, what are you doing? I said, Frank, can I see you for five minutes? He said, no, you can't. I'm a bit, I'm a bit busy. And I just, every time Hamish was trying to wheel him towards up here, I kept on stood in his way and said, look, please, just five minute, minutes. This went, went on for five, minute, five minutes. And in the end, he said, OK, I'll give you five minutes. Follow us. And then we went. Surreal. I mean, just surreal. So, come on, I'll show you in. Because I've been here two weeks before for my official like, meet, meeting with Frank, because I won a Renault Spider series in 96. So I'd done the test at Silverstone, did a good job there, and then came in to meet Frank and Patrick. And because that was like, you know, a major important day for me, I made sure that everybody I interact with, I was as charming, as you know, memorable as possible. And it served me well, because when I then door stopped them, the two girls on reception, they said, oh, hello, Jason. You're here to see Frank. And I said, well, you, actually, yeah, I am. Can you, any chance I can see him for five minutes? And he went, yeah, yeah, no sweat. And then they put me on some seats over there. And I still got to thought I'm in. And then it dawned on me, actually, I've got to get past Nicola, who was Frank's scary PA. And this wall what wasn't there. And in that far corner, there's some metal stairs which came down. And after about 10 minutes or so, I got over there. She basically came down with a right scowl on her face. She said, what, what do you think you're doing? And I said, well, I just want to see Frank for five minutes. And um, is there any way I can see him just for five minutes? She said, no, you can't, you can't, you need an appointment. You can't just walk in off the streets. I couldn't just give in. So, you know, it got, it got awkward actually, because I was saying, oh, please look, can I just see him for five minutes? And then she let a gem of information out, which I'm convinced of this day she did on purpose, because it then gave me an immediate out where I could retired to my tread trenches and she basically said, look, you're wasting your time. He's not until lunchtime and it was about nine o'clock. So with that, I thought, right, I'm, I am wasting my time. So at least I can now apologize and, you know, give in if you like um, and live to fight another day. So I thanked Nicola, apologized again. So look, I'm ever so sorry, but I just want to see him for five minutes. When Frank does come in, can you let me know I've been to see him? And off I went. And, um, <laughs> and then, then, then I went in the car park, got in my car and thought, what, the, what am I going to do, do now? Anyway, the plan was, I moved my car so that I could see the security booth. So when Frank did arrive, I would be there. So I waited outside for three hours. On my own, and, and I had a beat up. Ford Sierra in 90 day white. <laughs> it, was a, it was a wreck. I remember sitting in it. I had a suit on. Why did I have a suit on? I had an empty briefcase. What was that for? And I sat there and I basically smoked myself to oblivion and I made two phone calls. I called my dad and told him what I was doing and he just said, great idea. And then I called up Mike Knight from Winfield and Mike didn't say great idea. He said, do you know what, JP? You've got to do what you've got to do. <laughs> so that wasn't like, you know, that didn't fill me with that much confidence. But then actually, at the end of the conversation, he said, mate, just go for it. And then I saw Frank's car, jumped out of my car, and as it shot past the reception, I thought it's going to go to a secret entrance right around the back. Well, it, obviously it didn't. So now I'm in. And... Hamish wheeled in Frank. I'm still thinking, what am I doing? And he wheeled him over to the lift over there. And then he opened the lift door and then started to reverse Frank in. And I'm kind of thinking, well, what, 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 what do I do? And uh, I kind of looked in the lift and it was only enough for Hamish, Frank, and not a lot else. And Frank looked at me and said, are you coming or not? So then we got in the lift and, I mean, Frank's head was there. 
<laughs> and Amy, she's face. It was awkward to say the least. So anyway, but then we go up the lift, we get outside Frank's office, Nika comes out, scowls at me, and says, wait, wait there. Well, I'll call you when you're ready. When Frank's ready. 40 minutes, 40 minutes he kept me in, they kept me outside for. It wasn't a good 40 minutes, so I, I was in the right pickle. And I was thinking about things I, was, I wanted to say and nothing would stick. And I just decided that I was going to freestyle it, play it by ear. Anyway, then I got called in. Nicola came out, walked me into Frank's office. Two weeks before, when I came in for my, you know, w w winning the Spiders series, um, that was the first time I met Frank. And he was sat down at his desk. And then this time when I walked in, he stood up. But you couldn't see any chair behind him. Well, that completely threw me. And then the next thing, I got a cup of coffee. Nicola brought in a cup of coffee and then brought in Frank, you know, a, a, a glass of cordial, but with one of them curly straws in, stuck it on a book. Well, that, that flipped me out. It just didn't know what, what was going on. So the long and short of it is, you know, I didn't know what to say. I, kind of, I, can't, I think I banged on his desk actually and said, Frank, please give me a chance. You know, don't, don't, don't just give it to... to failed Formula One drivers, that their career's going down and mine's going up. Just give us a chance, please, please give me a break. And do you know what? He kind of smiled at me, said, look, I've got a crack on, but thanks for coming. And off I went. And the funniest thing is when I, when, when I walked out that door, I felt totally content that, you know, there's nothing more I can do. If this doesn't come off, not invention, not, not you know, not, not, nothing gained. Later on that afternoon, I got a phone call from Ian Harrison, who was the, the team that, that, that manager of the, the Renault team. And he said, I've heard a whisper you've been in to see Frank. <laughs> I was like, yeah. And he said, look, um, it would be out of turn, you know, for me to say anything, but it's gone down rather well. Keep your phone on. And within a couple of days, the phone rang. It was Frank. He said, right, I need you at Snestetton in a week or two. It's you versus Morbidelli versus Jean-Christophe Bou Bouillon. You'll get the same amount of tyres, same engineer. Fastest man gets a job. That's history. So, you know, from, from, from the end of 96, you know, being, being, you know, I did this test and there was myself, Bouillon and Morbidelli at Snetterton. And, um, but nevertheless, I, I, left that, I left the day at Snetterton thinking, you know what, I've, I think I've done okay. I think, I think, I think I've, done, I've done all right. There's a chance. Anyway, I get a call from Frank saying he wants to sit, see me. And um, I didn't have to blag my way in at that time. And yeah, went, went to the reception, went up to see Frank. Nicola was definitely on side. She was friendly. And I got in his office and he, um, he tossed over a contract like that and said, look, we'd love you to drive for us. Sign that. And that was it. And I went, oh, I need to read it first. He said, no, you don't. Sign it. And we argued and I said, no, I can't, I can't, I can't. I need to, and he said, well, what, what do you want to talk, talk about? I said, well, I need to read it first. He said, you don't. He said, just go to the back page, have a look at the numbers. Are you happy with those? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm happy with year one. I'm happy with year two. Although I'd like a little bit, but year three, if you want me for year three, then clearly there's desire. Can I, I think we should have a bit more money, just if that, that's the deal. That whole process, walking out of the building, thinking, Christ, it's come off, it's all happened. And within days, my life had changed. But it was an amazing experience. And, um, you know, I learned an awful lot from Alain Menu. you know, he was my first teammate and at that moment in time he was the best touring car driver in the world. So what an opportunity to be pitched against the best. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, Williams gave me brilliant engineer in Jerry Hughes, uh, you know, some fantastic people to work with and they did everything within their power to, to, to make my debut as successful as possible. So much so that for the first three races of the year, I stuck it on pole. But importantly, it got me out the shop window. 
because effectively I'd landed the best seat in touring car from nowhere, if you like. Yeah, amazing days, amazing days. And what, what, it, took me, it took me three quarters of the year to win my first race. Uh, I think we won two, two or three races that year, I think. But Alan won the championship, so to be around, I ended up third, missing out on second in the championship by one point. Me and Alan came to blows at the end of the year, got a bit snotty. But it was a fantastic, fantastic time. And I can remember when at Silverstone for the last race of the 1999 season, as a guy called Barry Hinchcliffe, who used to run BHP TV, who did all the, the broadcast. And Barry came out to interview me as the last race was over. And uh, he, caught, he caught a load of emotion on me. And I was, I was, in, I was sad, I was, I was very sad. I had tears in my eyes that, that it was all coming to an end. And he, I remember him saying, not, kind of beckoning me to say, let it out, we want to see this. And so yeah, I was quite tearful when it all ended in 1999. And then I went off to Vauxhall and became a, became a, uh, a regular fixture on the touring car calendar. But yeah, we, we, Williams for me was, um, yeah, it made my career. Very grateful to everybody here. While the drivers do their work on the track, the team couldn't exist without sponsorship. Every year, Adam Weaver and other team members travel the country to convince and negotiate with companies to bring them on board or extend an existing deal. These sponsors work in the background where all the smaller things add up to what fans experience at the races. One of those companies is Eye Catchers. So we are um, eye catchers and we're based just outside Preston in Lancashire. I'm Mary Louise and I'm the company director. Uh, we got involved with them, I'm thinking four or five years ago, um, we got a call from Cy. We got a lot of, lot of calls for, from, for people wanting to get involved with various things, but he just um, he stood out very well to me and uh, got my interest. And, uh, he sent me over the information and said they were looking for sponsors. Um, I've got to be honest, never heard of them before, the team. Um, but we like going to racing events, we, you know, we go to Silverstone, etc. So it was something that, that caught my interest and uh, we decided to, uh, to start working with them and provide all the passes for all the, all the, the events and the hospitality that they do through the season. Each, each event we provide all the the VIP passes that you get given when you go for a hospitality day um, and obviously you wear the badge all day you can go in and out of the hospitality tent um, and we make we make these for each of the each of the events throughout the season for them we have a uh, we get the information from Cy about a week before each event because obviously each one has different information on with the course the timings for all the different races and the meal times etc uh, we put all that together for them and then get them to him three or four days before the event itself happens. In the grand scheme of it, it, does, it is quite a small part but it's, it's very, very essential and you couldn't really run the, the hospitality events etc without it. It's been a really good experience working with them and uh, he always rings me every year and says, you know, are, are you going to do it again this year? I say, of course we are. <laughs> you don't need to ask me that. <laughs> Another sponsor is Absolute Alignment, which plays a crucial role in the team. I'm Chris from Absolute Alignment. We supply equipment to garages, tyre shops, body shops and motorsport companies. So I started Absolute Alignment myself 12 years ago and in that time we supplied the equipment to the garages across the country. Um, everybody from tyre shops to body shops to motorsport specialists. Specifically, we've developed some special race equipment to be used for the race cars, to be portable to the race tracks, um, so that you can use it in the paddock, in the pit lane, or in your workshop, or, or at home in your garage. So for each race track we go to, we have a different setup for the car. Um, if it's Neston, we might want it slightly less tow for going fast up the straights. For Brands Hatch, we run more tow out to get quick around the corners. It's all tra track specific. Um, we work with the engineers at Powermax, it's a, it's a, a two-way street, 
if I need some advice for what to do on our own cars, we've got all the experts at the PowerMax side of things. And if they need any advice from us on how to use equipment to optimize it, they can phone us as well. So we worked with PowerMax uh, for about four or five seasons now. Uh, we started working with them as a technical partner, uh, bringing in the equipment and helping them to move on from streamlining the car, which is the, the way we literally put string around a car and measure with a tape measure to using the digital alignment equipment to speed up their process between, uh, between rounds. The reason we work for PowerMax is they came to us. We were already in the paddock working with some other touring car teams and they wanted to update their equipment. Um, and obviously we've got quite a good brand recognition for being the experts in, in the motorsport field. We like working with PowerMax for threefold. Firstly, they're part of the groups um, which the, the PowerMax brand sell to some people we sell to, some of the, uh, the, the motor factors, the distributors out there. So it ties in with that. We work with them on the motorsport side of things because when we go into a garage and talk to a tire shop um, and they say, oh, well, who uses this equipment? We can say it's used by the teams, by the PowerMax and the touring cars. That just ticks a big box. All the mechanics love the fact that you know, it's used on Plato's car, Dan Lloyd's car, and also they can do it on their, their Vauxhall Astra, um, which has been lowered or, or, or whatever. Um, and thirdly, it's motorsport. We love motorsport. It's a fun side of the business. This is why we do it. We get to go and be involved and just you know, be, be all part of the whole touring car scene. As a brand, Absolute Alignment, we've only just started. We're 10 years into the journey and working with companies like PowerMax, which just bring us to the fore in front of people's minds. We're, we're ever expanding and looking forward to another 10 years of working with PowerMax and other race teams. And uh, hey, let's see one day, we might even be in Formula One. Kappa is an established brand that most of us have come across. They supply the branded clothing for the team. Next, we're off to make plans for the 2022 season. So we're up here in Manchester, it's October 21. Season hasn't even finished yet. Uh, and we are here to meet with the guys from Kappa to talk about all the team wear for next year, year two of the deal, um, and just basically get everything finalized. Let's go in. Hello, it's Sai. Yeah. This year, retail, we sold 5,160 quid. Jeez. Yeah, so we were about 25 grand down on our income from it. Now, obviously, that's partly because there was stuff was late and everything. Anyway, that was, you know, that's, it, it is what it is. We can get orders on our system yeah. as soon as possible. Um, our head office in France are in the middle of doing all the, the buys for mm. next year's stock rate, like team wear stock rate. A lot of the sponsor deals are renegotiated every year to benefit all parties and to tackle all the challenges of a new season. So the challenges when entering any new sport, especially an elite sport, uh, is predominantly understanding the market, um, its fans and obviously the sport in general. Um, we look after multiple sports across the entire world that have different start dates uh, across the year, so manufacturing times and uh, lead times, delivery things are throughout the whole year. Um, for us, we just wanted to engage with a fan base of an elite sport that will grow our brand and it's quite um, organic for us to, to come with a, a brand and a team like PowerMax where you've already got an incredible set of fans and a very positive outlook on how you want to grow your brand and we want to be part of that really. So with year one under our bow, um, going into year two, there's lots of things that we've um, experienced from a challenge perspective. Um, entering any deal, uh, entering any new sport comes with, um, I suppose, uh, an element of learning. Um, understanding how people like to trade, companies like to trade, fans expect product and, and in general engagement. So doing that in a COVID affected year um, is always challenging for everybody. Um, we want to engage massively with the PowerMax fans this year and we want to have a huge presence with the brand and obviously with um, the business. So we're looking to launch product sooner and get it into the country quicker and into an area where we can provide a service for the fans. I mean, obviously, when we first um, discussed the opportunity, uh, the, the numbers were presented to us from an engagement point of view, a reach point of view, and kind of a footprint situation. I had no idea how big it was. I mean, obviously, I've loved sport all my life, been involved in this industry for a long time, 
Um, I just want to be involved massively and so do the brand from a going to the races, being with the fans. The team have been great, really enjoyable to work with the team um, and yeah, we, we're really looking forward to the next two years. Join us next time to see how the team performs in the second half of an all-action season, battling against their closest rivals and making sure they are prepared for the all-new hybrid era in the 2022 season.